This episode of the show is brought to you from the Salesman.org HubSpot Studios. On This Week in Sales, Brainshark allegedly being in violation of biometric privacy rights and what the heck that means. We'll cover that in a second. Revenue intelligence, salespeople being stuck in the past and much, much more. My name is Will Barron. I'm the founder over at Salesman.org and joining me, the co-host of this show, the Darth to my Vader, Victor, sales, le- sales training legend, in fact, Victor Antonio. Victor, how's it going, mate? I'm doing good, Will. I'm doing good. All good on this side. How about yourself? I am very well. Um, I've got some things to tease towards the end of the show, some developments over at Salesman.org that I want this audience, this week in sales, to get the, well, it's, we're going to talk the news of Salesman.org on the show, as we should be doing. Uh, we'll, get the, we'll get the scoop there. So yeah, it's all all going good. Hang out, it's going to be good. Hang out, it's going to be good. Well, let's jump into some sales news. Let's not mess around here. I'm intrigued to get your thoughts on this, being the uh, an expert in the space of, of machine learning, AI within sales technology. This is a article from law360.co.uk, and I'm going to overtly be careful about how I say things because I don't want to get sued. Sales training software company charged with privacy breaches. Tech firm, this is quoting the website, tech firm Brainshark has been hit by proposed federal class claims that the company is using artificial intelligence to analyze facial biometric data of sales employees and rating their sales presentation videos, which is in violation of the biometric privacy rights of Illinois users. We'll go into it in a second, Victor, but is this something that you foresee happening when we're talking about AI? We talk about it every week, right? AI and um, tracking content and clicks and different things. Obviously, this is one step further when we're looking at facial recognition, perhaps a step too far, uh, according to uh, this, I guess it's a, a lawsuit, right? Against uh, alleged law or a lawsuit of a alleged accusation against Brainshark. Is this something that you saw coming in the, in the world of tech sales? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I highlighted the company uh, a couple of years ago called Effectiva. And so Effectiva has one of the largest database repositories of facial recognition, like anything from micro just. In fact, a lot of this technology is being used in cars like Tesla and things like that, because that will tell you, you know, it can actually detect whether you're falling asleep, whether you're angry, all that stuff. Right. If you're angry, it changes the channel from Metallica <laughs> to Yo-Yo Ma, you know, <laughs> or whatever it does to relax you. So the fact and I always thought that it would be cool that while you're doing a Zoom call that you can have the biometrics, the facial recognition, uh, little tabs on the side of the head going happy, sad, not reacting, not engaging. And so I didn't know they were doing it already. So. This is interesting. If it's true, it'll be very interesting. I didn't know, for example, that there is such a thing as some rules for facial biometric data. Did you know that? Because I didn't know that. So uh, not an expert in the space, clearly, but I know, oh, I think I know. I I think New York, for example, had issues with, but Amazon came out with a technology that used facial recognition and New York and a, and a few other places, cities and states, I think Silicon Valley esque kind of companies and, and uh, local council complained about it as well of the police using this Amazon facial recognition software, and then the data goes into the Amazon machine, and they've got all this facial recognition of people just walking around through the streets. So I know that was the tipping point, and that got a lot of uh, whether it's this is federal, uh, whether it's federal, whether it's individual states, whether it's town cities pushing back against a lot of this stuff. I don't think we've seen this in the UK. In the UK, it's probably happening and we just no one's bothered about complaining about it. Um, but I know that there has been, from a, a state perspective and a government perspective in different places, this has been a pushback on. So I assume this is related to that. But clearly, I'm not an expert in US federal policy on facial recognition. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because you know, we watch all these spy movies, right? Where they just kind of like, do, 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 you know, hone in on somebody's face and says, I found him, he's at the yeah. airport. And then they go, enhance, and, and it zooms in. Yeah, enhance, yeah. and there's no <laughs> data there, but somehow it pulls data. Enhance. Yeah. yeah. So, so the government is apparently using it somehow. So, But it's interesting how Brain Shark is using it. So I'll let you continue on this one. So uh, this is, so continuing from the article, Brain Shark used by more than 1,000 companies around the world. It violates, by, allegedly violates biometric privacy law by analyzing facial geometry in uploaded sales presentations 
to analyze and score facial expressions and emotions of the presenter without first obtaining informed consent from Illinois users. So see, I got a problem with this. Okay, so <laughs> this, the, the complainant Lori Willick. So, okay, let's kind of pull back here. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going in defense of Brain Shark here. Dude, I'm going in defense of Brain Shark. Okay, so if information is loaded up online, let's just say it's online, let's say it's public, it's YouTube, it's uploaded, it's public. All they're doing is basically recognizing what you're saying, how you're saying, and analyzing your 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 gestures, your micro expressions and things of that nature, and then making a determination then using that data. They're not using your personal data like, hey, Lori, here's how we're going to sell you because we know who you are. I mean, they're just, it's like if, all right, you ever watch those newscast show where they bring on a body language expert sure. to analyze somebody's body language? Isn't this the same thing? It's just a machine doing it. So it, if somebody's reading your body language, are they in violation? you know, of your privacy. Yeah, but this YouTube is a public... I, I agree with what you're saying, right? Yeah. All, and it, uh, my thoughts on all of this come down to it's the user's responsibility to check the terms and conditions if they're concerned about this. And if they are concerned about it, then they shouldn't upload content data to a platform that uses whatever technology they're trying to avoid. I think what the issue is here, allegedly, is that BrainShark did not ask or do not include um, the appropriate things within the terms and conditions. And so the facial recognition was used without asking for permission. So that maybe the user didn't know, they couldn't have the intent, they couldn't decide for themselves. And BrainShark should have had these th processes in place. But fundamentally, it's, it's my belief that uh, if you upload something proactively to a platform and you've not read the terms and conditions, uh, or you're not happy with it and you continue to upload the content, whatever it is, then it's it's your own fault. You're a sucker. Now, all this clearly gets weird when Facebook is, for example, we have the Facebook pixel on salesman.org. So even though I'm not signed into Facebook on my laptop, if I go to salesman.org, Facebook is still collecting data about me and then referring that back to my Facebook profile. So that is inadvertent tracking, which then starts to muddy the water with some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But in, yeah. in Brainshark's defense, I, either they've screwed up and they've not asked permission when by law they should probably ask permission, or uh, th there's been there's been some kind of mix up here. Yeah, I guess we don't understand because it says uh, facial geometry, analyzing facial geometry in uploaded sales presentations. And I guess we don't understand what that means. Like, what's the context of that? When you say uploaded, uploaded where? Like, for example, I think Zoom is smart enough now or is smart now that they actually put the approval thing. You're being recorded. Are you OK with that? Yes. Right. Exactly. Now, so so that fits in with their term conditions. It seems like BrainShark haven't done this for this <clears throat> specific law in this specific state. We don't need allegedly. to debate it too far. Yeah. Allegedly. 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 It, sure. seem, it seems yeah. like that's what the case is. Yeah. And by the way, didn't BrainShark just got bought out? Do you remember? We talked about this a week or two ago, right? They I mean, just got bought out I mean, by somebody big. Big tin can, I think, bought them. Okay. So good luck, BrainShark. This will be interesting <laughs> yeah, to see good, what the outcome good is. Good timing to sell. Get get yeah, rid of yeah. that company before I get rid of those shares before uh, no. it all comes and hits the fad. But, but, but I think this gives me a better understanding of why Big Tin Can, horrible name, actually bought this company. This could be one of the bigger reasons because I think this is the future of selling. In many ways, being able to read people's micro expressions and adjust your presentation on the fly is key. For sure. Well, let's move on to other ways of pulling in selling data that may or may be less or more legal. Mediafly launches revenue, unique revenue intelligence solution. Don't don't let me screw this up, Victor. Don't let me get this wrong. This isn't another revenue intelligence solution. This is a unique one. Mediafly launches a unique revenue intelligence solution to drive deal confidence. This is from PR Newswire. Dot com. Mediafly, uh, quoted from the article, has announced Revenue 360, a new revenue intelligence solution that aggregates sales and content, account activity, engagement data across the customer journey to help sales leaders accurately assess opportunity health, improve forecasting, and deal wins. There's tons of stuff in this document that we can come back to. But basically, the premise is this isn't just salespeople going, oh, yeah, I think there's a 20% chance of this closing. It's, it's from, uh, I guess, content marketing or initial outreach or advert to end of sales process. I'm assuming that they're using similar to Facebook pixels here or pix pixeling the user, 
seeing what content they go on or they go, the people who buy watch this, they consume this, they sign up for this webinar, they get on with a salesperson, they get on with a, a specialist, product specialist within the company, they speak to another salesperson, then they buy. They're tracking everything across the sales process. And this, counterintuitively to what I usually say on the show, is actually interesting. I think this is revenue intelligence that could actually spit out useful data and it knows that a thousand people have purchased and a hundred thousand people have been to the kind of like through the uh, the funnel and dropped off. Well, we know that if you don't communicate within the first two weeks with this piece of content, because we've got the whole life cycle, the whole buyer's journey, uh, you need to you need to get on top of it. You need to get your finger out your ass. You need to get on with this and get this this put out into into the the buyer's domain. I think that is we're now verging on actual useful sales enablement. What do they call it? Revenue intelligence. Same thing. Uh, and, and and pushing these notifications in real time to salespeople. This is the, we need that entire scope of the buying journey to actually make some of this really useful. I agree. By the way, I was actually surprised you put this one in here because you're always, you know, kind of harping on these uh, new technologies with AI. First of all, let me just call the people over at Mediafly. Let me call out the marketing team. You lazy bastards. Everybody uses 360. Jesus, can we just use a different name? Revenue 360, this 360, everybody uses 360. Is there any piece of originality over there? Anyway, aside from that, I totally agree. The fact that you can basically document the full journey from A to Z, the beginning of the buyer journey, I think this is the future. Now, are they really unique? Mediafly, are you really unique? I don't think so. Because I, if I go over to Salesforce, I know I can find this stuff. Are you they sure? have all this stuff. Yes, they have. They're not unique. Now, well, let me give you a quote. Gonna... Let me give you a quote, Victor, from Carson yeah. Constant, CEO and founder of Mediafly. Many companies claim to have revenue intelligence capabilities, but their solution only provides users with partial intelligence. I agree with that. By the way, notice he slipped in the word Carson Conant, uh, slipped in the word many companies. He didn't say all companies. <laughs> He fair, said many fair. companies. Yeah, that is called a ventilating modifier. In other words, leave some space for it to breathe because <laughs> I might be wrong. And you are, Carson, to some extent. So, But a, a lot of this stuff is, is some of the bigger platforms have a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, I will say this, that it is, you know, it is the quality of the coding that's going to determine the quality of the output and how good this is. I don't think they're unique, but I mean, if you were unique, you wouldn't use Revenue 360. You come up <laughs> with a unique name. That'd be the first thing I'd go. But uh, joking aside, I, I love where they're going with this, by the way. Joking sure. aside, I really love where they're going with this. I think tracking the, I did a presentation, I think I told you, right, for Salesforce called The Future of Sales. Uh, and we talked about, you know, the buyer journey. And I documented everything as detailed as getting down to whether you're using a smartphone, uh, you know, whether you're using iOS or using Android, what browser you're using, you know, and then all the way through the customer journey to figure out where they bounced away. And I think the data is so massive that you're going to need a system like this in the future to really be able to kind of close more deals. For sure. And look, uh, over at Salesman.org, we'll touch about it later on, we've got some changes coming with our with our content. So even and the point of this is that even plebs like myself, even like people who have you know, tiny businesses versus what we talk about usually on, on the show, both headcount, revenue-wise, everything else, I am in the data at the moment looking at it's not tens of thousands of traffic that we get each day, but it's, you know, it's it's a thousand, couple of thousand. And we're going through all this data and looking for where to say, where do people come into the blog? Where do people find us? How do people get on there? How can I then get them to either the obvious thing is to get them to sign up to a newsletter or our webinar, but perhaps people aren't ready to do that yet. So how do I include mainly women specific blog posts or specific podcast episodes. How do I include the next step, which is listen to the podcast, sign up for that, or um, click on this next article, which is similar, which goes a little bit further past the, hey, I've got your attention into, I've got your attention. We've got this product, this training product that might be useful as well, which then leads onto a webinar or email sign up. So if people like myself are doing it, and I'm doing all this manually, of course, by looking at the data and Google Analytics have different uh, flows and charts so you can you can kind of visualize some of this. Then bigger companies with more data and more sophisticated teams working on this, they must be doing incredible things behind the scenes to to build that buyer's journey and to make it as they want it to be as, as literal as possible so they can track it, A-B test and, uh, and experiment, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I didn't mention this to you, Will. We started using a software uh, this month called Oribi. 
And it's beyond Google Analytics in the sense that it tracks more, allows you to do a, really a lot of interesting things. I'll give you an update on the report, but my point as it relates to this article is that we have to keep, we have to raise our intelligence game on in terms of how people got to our website, what they're looking at, you know, why they're leaving or why they're staying. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love what the company's doing though. Yep, uh, it's clearly the future of everything. And if you knew, if you could visual, if salespeople could visualize some of this stuff, we have cold calls, cold emails, we've sending out content with social selling. If I know for me, I, I, how would you describe yourself, Victor? I know this is a bit of a fallacy. This isn't actual, uh, there's no science to really back. There's not a lot of science to back this up. Would you pick, Would you describe yourself as uh, visual oriented, uh, audio or kinesthetic? How would you, uh, or whatever else there is, is probably others. How would you describe your, how you experience the world? Visual and kinesthetic would be the two. Sure. So doing I, and watching. I'm, yeah. I'm like 99% visual, right? Mm. So uh, if I could see my efforts for cold calling, cold email, social selling, whatever mm -hmm. is prospecting, and then sending content, uh, follow up meetings, the success of my presentations, if I could see this on, I know we got uh, analytical sales funnels, but they're not as good as the marketing funnels that you can see, and it's not as easy to test, and you've got far less data. If someone could suss that out and give me a visual, a uh, beautiful visual representation of what I need to do this end to get whatever I need out the other end, again, it exists in a CRM that looks crappy and you don't want to study it and it's it's not very intuitive. If someone could do a beautiful job of that, I'd be way more likely to then, or, or even, I, I, I'm kind of wondering here a little bit in my thoughts, but even make it then so it's more gamified of what I need to do at each step add a little bit of AI in to push me one direction or the other versus the people I'm working with internally or competing against internally. That's a, I feel like that's a product that would help me as a seller for sure. So if they've got some of this data and they can build that to make it beautiful, um, I feel like there's, a, there's an extra layer of value that could be added on top of all of this. I was going to add that as you're describing the visual, because I think I think visual and kinesthetic really go hand in hand. Visually, we can see the funnel or whatever we have to do, the next steps. But what if that's the what? Right. But then you need the how, which is the kinesthetic piece. So imagine that's where you would insert, for example, your product sales, you know, selling made easy. Right. All of a sudden, boom, there's the how I'm at this point visually in the cycle. Now, let me see the how. Yep. And then you walk them through how to do it. I think that's the combination that I mean, we're looking for that because that's how we learn. Sure. And it almost becomes a self-fulfilling <clears throat> prophecy then of you will then intuitively start to experiment and you will change the how over time. And if you've got enough people experimenting with the hows and you have one kind of, I don't know how you describe it, you'd have the God how that everyone else kind of like builds on, that builds on top of everyone else's, um, how they are doing things. You have all different personalities involved, different techniques, the little bits of, you know, I can talk about this uh, congruently, but you can talk about that congruently, different expertise that then would build into the greatest onboarding system personalized for mm -hmm. your company, your product, um, that, that could possibly By the way, exist. I, I, I visualize an AI system because I know like there's a, uh, we talked about a company called Crystal Nose where it actually identifies the type of personality of the person you're talking to. So I would assume that they're going to build into the AI algorithm one day that type of cap capability where just listening to a little bit of the conversation is going to say, all right, Here's the, here's the type you're dealing with. Here's how you want to say it. So I don't have to think about which type. So even that's going to be automated away, I think. Sure. We, we tried that with our sales code assessment in our, our training program at Of mm -hmm. We did uh, part of the assessment. I've, I pulled it out now. I'll explain why in a second. But we pulled it out. And that, that broke down into whether you are audio, video, kinesthetic, or you know the, the different types as well. On top of that, and you, as you rightly pointed out, mixes of the two. And the goal was to collect enough data from our users who have uh, opted into all this, of course, um, to then we can readjust the content. So if someone is more audio focused on the training page, it would give a audio podcast that they could download rather than a video. But it just got so complicated so quickly and nobody cared about it that we pulled it out. Um, <laughs> but but if, if again, if a pleb like myself can do it with a small team, uh, an actual funded company could do incredible uh, kind of onboarding software solutions with just a, just a handful of the data that we just outscribe, uh, outlined, which is, I think that'd be really cool. We're, we're, we're at an inflection point in technology and learning and adaptation. I really believe we are yep. because when, as you say, when we plebs even start playing with this stuff, that lets you know, that's it. We're in yep. it. We're starting to make some real changes. So, uh, 
Keep up or get dragged, as my friend would say. Cool. Well, talking about uh, me having zero funding, let's move on to uh, this article from yourstory.com entitled Sales Tech SaaS Startup GTM Buddy Raises $2 million Led by Steralis Venture Partners. I think I'm saying that right. So here I'm quoting. So I've got two quotes here, one from the uh, Venture Capital Group and then one from the CEO of the company. I think they kind of go nicely with each other. So this is from Alok Goyle, partner at Stellaris Venture Partners. He, he says, quote, Despite advances in underlying technologies, current sales enablement solutions fail to meet the needs of the users. Agreed. They are mostly a user interface on top of a classical folder structure which uh, with basic search and tracking capabilities. Wait, like, pause it, pause it. We got to pause it because I think this is probably the most honest individual yep. we've had on the show so far in terms <laughs> of quotes because he says, they are mostly a user interface on top of a classical folder structure with basic search and tracking capability, which is what you've complained about yep. many times in the past, right? It's just well, Google Drive, but specific to a, a company, right? And um, so, I carry on the quote. Like many other enterprise uh, processes, we believe that this is this space is ripe for disruption. So that's from the investor side. Let me pull back to the the CEO uh, and co-founder of G10 Buddy. This is uh, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I apologize. Seed Seedra Ped Penny D. Do you want to have a go at that name? I'm sorry. I'm just totally. Seedra Pedded Penny. Okay, close enough. He says, quote, G10 Buddy leverages the latest advancements in technology design, which I thought was important, and design and AI to deliver the right information to the sellers at the right time. Information that is contextually relevant to the buyers available within the tools that are used by them on a daily basis. So clearly this is the startup. Uh, I don't know. They must have some kind of prototype to get venture funding at this level. Uh, like a, you can have an A round here of uh, venture funding. But this is exactly my complaint with the whole of the sales enablement industry of, as far as I can see, I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm happy for to jump on a, a demo with one of your team if you're listening to this episode and you are a product manager, salesperson, at one of these uh, uh, you know larger sales enablement companies. I'm happy, ha I would love to be proven wrong. But everything that I've seen, the few demos that have been on, without calling anyone out, without um, uh, kind of stoking the fire too much, has been that it is basically... Marketing upload all this crap. Sales don't use the crap. Marketing then go, well, if you do use this, there's some basic data that people open it and then they view a third of it and maybe it's good at this point in the sales cycle and then sales still don't send it at all because they'd rather have a conversation and do what they know best, which is have the gift of the gap and, and talk nonsense to a buyer. And then marketing go, okay, salespeople are not sending this and then that's the end of it. This seems to go on top of all that and alleviate some of these issues. It'll, it'll be interesting to say, see how they incorporate the AI piece because I'm starting to notice a pattern here. And I think this this this, this announcement really highlights something. So I'm glad you brought this quote up from Ala Goyal, whatever his name is. Uh, what I love what he says that it's it's classical folder structure with basic search. What I've noticed is that there's some systems have basic search, which is what he's describing. Then the next level is predictive analytics which is just math, regression algorithms and things like that, not true AI. And then there's true AI. And what I'm noticing is people toggle between basic search, Boolean functions and stuff like that, and then also into your basic predictive analytics. Very few do AI. And so it'll be interesting to see if they can really do it. If they got $2 million of funding, you know, they got a good, they're probably in the process of, they just finished up their, what is it, the minimum viable product, got $2 million in funding, I love their enthusiasm. They think they can do it differently. What startup doesn't think they can do it differently? But I love their name, GTM Buddy, also known as Get 'em Buddy. <laughs> go, go to market, buddy. It's probably what they were going for. But yeah, um, it's I like, cool. I like Get 'em. I like Get 'em, buddy. <laughs> it's it's. Well, I, I, you were right. I, I I can't remember what you said verbatim, Victor. But I feel like we're on the cusp. When, for example, and I, I'm not trying to play plug salesman.org here, but we our search is isn't just boolean anymore, and it's going on. Uh, the sales code results of the the individual and what content that they have been through in our training program, what they haven't when they search, it throws up the, just, there's like 6 million words of podcast transcripts and stuff that has all been transcribed that's in the product and will eventually be on, on the website once I get around to uploading it all, that it, it will suss out. And it is it is dumb. It's not AI. It's machine. It's not, it's barely machine learning. It's, barely. If you, if this box is ticked and this box is ticked, then the user probably wants more of this stuff. It's yeah. not rocket that's, science. That's, that's math. Yeah, but that's but if we're doing math. it, 
then a yeah. two, uh, and all we're doing is using plugins and paying for tools that already exist, then, you know, someone with funding and a great team could do incredible things. You know, it might have cost 200 million to develop some of this stuff 10 years ago, and maybe you can do better now or two. Hmm. Well, like I said, I'm agreeing with you. I think a, a lot of people are doing just simple, basic things, and they're trying to push it off as true AI or machine learning, which it's not. And so it'll be interesting to see where this company goes with this product. But again, maybe they'll be e pluribus unum, one of many sales enablement or engagement platforms. Who knows? Well, talking about a company that is doing it right, this is from siliconrepublic.com and everywhere else as well, because this press release went out yesterday and it's all over the place. CRM platform, HubSpot, goes on an all out, goes all in on the UK with its first office opening. So uh, for d disclosure, HubSpot sponsor loads of content that we do over at salesman.org, um, to be fair. But I thought this was interesting because just some of the numbers in here from a HubSpot's customer's perspective. Um, so quote from the article, HubSpot, the customer relationship management platform for scaling companies, today announced that it's expanding its investment in the UK market by opening its first London office and committing to hiring employees across England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, 70 new jobs, all this good stuff. What I thought was interesting, and I didn't know this from a, a percentage of customer wise, the HubSpot, the company, recently surpassed 121,000 paying customers, which is a, a shit ton. Wow. 1 billion in annual reoccurring revenue. And the UK has become the second largest market globally and the largest within Europe. So in the UK, they've got 10,000 paying customers alone uh, and 40% year on year growth. I actually slightly blew my mind how big of a market the UK is because clearly the, the main uh, market is going to be the US, right? But is that surprising to you? That many customers That's, and uh, that yeah, kind of like speed of growth as well? No, it's amazing. If I could give them an applause, I would. I don't thought get I'd it. add that in. <laughs> I was kind of applauding them for the big number. They're killing it. It was just it was, no, what, was, what, what yeah. was interested to me, Victor, was the fact that I would have thought it'd be like three percent UK, five percent UK, um, okay. and you know the UK being the biggest in Europe because they've got offices in um, I think they've got offices in Germany and, and offices elsewhere as well. So I would have thought the UK would just been way smaller, our tiny little tiny little nation of sixty million people. Um, it clearly has uh, com uh, is uh, as they kind of had to reference themselves for scaling companies. Obviously, the UK seems to have uh, a bunch of scaling startups that hopefully are going to do well on, on kind of the back of what the shift in the environment and everything's going on right now. I, I, I assume the UK was more financial based and, and that side of things, but it's interesting to me those numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's not too surprising to me. I mean, those are the biggest markets, right? I mean, everybody else follows, right? It's you know it's U.S. I hate to say it that way. Unless you get China, it would be interesting to see if they have any China numbers. That let me, if you just keep talking for a second, let me see yeah. where our it's viewers HubSpot. come from. Yeah, because it would be interesting to find out, for example, for HubSpot, you know, where the majority of their, if the majority of their business is in the U.S. and then let's say the U.K., Europe, uh, the other way around. But what's like where does China fit in? Because I think they would be big data users as well. Uh, I'm trying to think of maybe the the UAE or the Gulf states, something like that like Dubai, places like that, where a lot of business is done, that maybe they got more platform users. But it could also be that, because HubSpot is a US-based company, is that correct, Will? Correct. Yeah, and so maybe, uh, it's just the beginning, maybe we're the epicenter and it's just finally rippling out and people are really paying attention to this data. So let's add, a few num let's add a few cool. numbers here from the Salesman.org YouTube channel, right? Which this video will be on, and it's also on the uh, <laughs> Amazing Victor Antonio YouTube channel as well. The last 28 days, 43% of viewers on the Salesman.org YouTube channel, 43.5% uh, of viewers came from the United States. Mm. What do you think was the next biggest uh, geography for, for viewers? India. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you've clearly looked at the data as well recently, right? No, no. I, about a year ago, I looked at my data. And I remember India was always like number two for yeah. me. Wow. Yeah, India was always number two. And then sometimes you'll get Asia as number three. I've got... Then United Kingdom, unsurprisingly being Brit, then Canada, then Australia. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah. But India India's a great market, so it, it doesn't surprise me. So, HubSpot, come on. Get on your horse, buddy. Let's <laughs> so, get to India. So, that's that's that section. Let's move on to some sales training news. Victor, our salespeople okay. stuck in the past. 
Well, this this article is very interesting. It was uh, I found it off the uh, a website called MDM, which stands for Modern Distribution Management. We never really talk about distribution, so I said, you know what, I'm I'm going different because you had great topics on technology purchases, you know, uh, new tech, you know, new announcements. So I thought this was interesting. Uh, so Gartner's Maria Bowden or Bolden. Uh, will be featured, uh, you know, at one of their uh, upcoming keynotes. But anyway, the title is "Make Sure Your Salespeople Aren't Stuck in the Past." Gardner's Maria Baldwin. I apologize if I'm mentioning, uh, pronouncing that incorrectly. One of the featured speakers at MDM's upcoming Sales GPS Conference. MDM again stands for Modern Distribution Management. So if you're a distributor, this is your website. Uh, at the at the conference, says that salespeople who still harbor a 2019 mindset stand little chance of survival. Now, up to that point, I still wasn't hooked in on what she was selling, if you know what I mean. But then this got interesting. If you're sending a sales professional who's stuck in 2019 into the sales environment of 2021, you're sending them into a kill box. I like this lady already. <laughs> sending them into a kill box. Uh, and then she had, distributors are the principal part of biz, a company's go-to market strategy. And if they have not adapted to what the world is both today and going forward, then they won't survive. Now, I'm, I'm gonna pause here, Will, because I think this is interesting because we're seeing a massive disruption in supply chains, right? But you're also seeing a massive consolidation in distributors. In other words, people are starting to buy other distribution companies up. So one of the things she's talked about as far as survival is, is one, those who survive, they are likely to build a moat around their business, making them impenetrable to competitors. I thought that was interesting. Number two, they can expect to see their valuations climb, making them more attractive to potential buyers. What are your thoughts on that so far when you think about distribution, you know, the supply channel and those two things combined? Because right now, getting inventory is very difficult. Uh, I think this is a an amazing case study of Amazon.com, right? So Amazon own everything. Amazon own the ships that take products from China to the UK, US. They own the warehousing. They own now the literal vans that come to your, this is in the UK, I'm sure it's the same in the US, the vans that come to your house and the essentially the postal workers that were once delivering for a, a myriad of companies are now exclusively driving for Amazon. Amazon, an amazing case study in this because they've just done this. They've built a motor around the business. No one will ever be able to compete with Amazon. Maybe Walmart, if they had uh, been more progressive five, 10 years ago, had the the cash and the, the, the foresight to do some of this, they failed. Amazon has just gone beyond them. No one now, like Amazon have like more boats. I can't remember the, uh, mm. it, uh, it's like someone like FedEx, a massive company. Amazon have like 10 times more planes than FedEx. Whatever, it, right. I'm, 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 that number isn't accurate, but it's, you know, it ser serves to, to prove the point. Amazon have done this. They've built that moat. No one will ever be able to catch up. No one can outfund Amazon. No one will be able to, you, you might take a trillion dollars to be able to build what Amazon has built over the past 20 years. And that money doesn't exist to be dumped into a competitor. And of course, then Amazon, because of this, because they've got the moat, because they are number one and they are likely to be number one for the rest of our lifetime, unless some dramatic shift in the market occurs where we want to buy from niche sellers rather than just Amazon or whatever it is. Like some of the backlash that goes on against Facebook, just owning the internet and the evil stuff that goes on within it. Unless there's bash like, uh, backlash like that, the valuation is just going to continue to climb because the revenue is going to continue to climb. So I think that's a. I think Amazon have read this article twenty years ago and put it into practice. Yeah, no, I agree. By the way, they did mention Amazon. Uh, she does mention Amazon. She mentions Granger, which is another large distributor here in the U.S. Uh, and there's companies like Graybar and all these large distrib distribution companies. But I, but I think the moat that she's alluding to, and we'd have to go to her GPS conference to hear the presentation. It's like two hours. Uh, but I think it's a digital moat. That, that would be part of the I, the structure around that, you know, protecting your business, because that's what Amazon really has. It has the digital moat and, and the data it's collecting is just immense. And I just thought this was interesting. But anyway, her presentation is titled. Well, me, sorry, of, Vida, I'm going to interrupt you. What can salespeople do to build a moat around themselves and their career? What can they do to become unsackable? What can they do to become as what Seth Godin called them, like remarkable or become a linchpin in Seth Godin language? Yeah, I, I think the word indispensable always comes to my mind. The ability to close deals at will, you know, no pun intended. Uh, the 
you know, when, when salespeople ask that question about, say, how can I how can I future proof myself in the business of selling? And the only way, I mean, you can go with the basics, right? Well, keep learning, keep learning, use the technology, so forth and so on. But at the end of the day, you got to close the deals. You got to be able to hunt. You got to hunt and close, hunt and close. I'm sorry, but it's it's as primitive as that. But I think the the technology is going to make them smarter. And I think this is what right now we don't have a lot of faith in data. Well, this is why people don't want, really want to use CRMs because the CRM has not proven to be a uh, return on investment of time. And I'm not saying everybody. I would just say, let's just split the difference. 50% of the companies get it. If I invest in putting data into the CRM, I'm going to get some information out that's going to allow me to close more deals. But there's another 50%, just using rough numbers here because I don't know, that have still not populated their CRMs. I'm blown away often by blown away often by companies who still don't have either a sales process or track their data via CRM. They start using spreadsheets in this day and age. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know the only way to remain unsackable is to be able to close. But think about it, Will. If you're good at selling, and you can help them make sales simple, right? If you're good at selling, then you know, you can, you'll always have a job, but I still think the ability to use the tools in front of you are gonna be key. I'd go one step further and say uh, brand. And it, I know this is cliche to talk about in the, the Instagram and uh, LinkedIn world that we live in, but if you are known in your space, people won't, your boss is not going to let you go to another company. Because this is what I did when I went from uh, Olympus in the UK uh, to Karl Stort. I just took inadvertently a bunch of customers w with me because they wanted to work with me. The products are very similar, which reminds me, I've not done the weekly unveiling of the endoscope, so I'll, I'll whack that on the table. There we go. We nearly we nearly went by a week about the endoscope being unveiled. I think if you I think if you <laughs> yeah. ever have look for your I'm gonna suggest something right now. Well, let me get this out of the way. Okay. For your selling made simple launch, right? What you should have this, in the official... This is not going anywhere. There's no camera going and, on this, Victor. And, that's that's a publicity there, I, stunt that well, I don't no, want to do. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, I say I, I want you to create an award. Call it the salesman.org award, and it should be an endoscope. You can have an endoscope on a plaque. On top, yeah, there you go. glue it to the top yeah. of the car. Yeah, it looks like an antenna now, but yeah. <laughs> I totally <laughs> forgot what I was going to say then. Oh, so I went from one company to another, took a load of people over there with me, I took a load of revenue, and that was like pre-social selling, right? So now in that marketplace, hopefully I would have some kind of, like, you know, you don't have to have a million followers. You don't need to have 10,000 followers. You need 50 decision makers that really like you. You need to be known to the higher ups within the companies that you're working with, even if you're not engaging with them directly each day, I feel like that makes you not unsackable, but it makes a sales manager go, ah, oh, it's almost an intangible that throws a, a kind of a banana uh, skin into, into the, I'm mixing two analogies here, into the cogs that then stops the sales manager going, Oh, well, he, he closed a few. He's not quite there on target, but I don't want to get sat, I don't want to get rid of him because there's the potential there, and I feel like that personal brand is potential that isn't quite utilized in the marketplace right now. Oh, it can be utilized in the marketplace, but I think it's going to become more important over time. I agree. I, it'll become more important over time. But but I, but I I'm I'm going, to, I'm going to strike a balance with that, Will, sure. and say that that people still have to get out and meet those customers that they're going after. Do you know what I mean? And so I think because sometimes we hide behind our brand a little too much, but your point is well taken that I think the brand is going to help them. But anyway, so I, I thought this was interesting because we never talk about distribution again. And the fact that that market is changing and where you get, because remember, you know, one of the differentiators may not be product anymore. One of the differentiators in the market might be delivery times. Mm -hmm or servicing. And so that's why distribution takes on a, a bigger role, which is why some of these companies are being bought up or actually being invested in. So it's really fascinating. By the way, speaking of brands, if you'll allow me, I thought this article was interesting. This was, uh, oh, I forgot to put the link here. We'll have to put it in the show notes. Uh, it says, why recruiters need to embrace content marketing? This is by HR Daily Advisor. Now, just the title alone, what does that tell you? I mean, does that make sense? Because it kind of caught my attention. That tells me that recruiters are massively commoditized. 90% of them are assholes and they don't care about you, your future, and they'll give you all this <laughs> to get you placed and then you'll never speak to them again. And so right. when you're looking for a new job, you probably want to go with a recruiter that you can build that rapport with, that trust with at scale, at distance, and that's going to be done much like sales via content. 
Anyway, I just thought this article was interesting. It says, you may not think recruitment and marketing go hand in hand, but a huge piece of making sure your talent pool is stuck with the best and the brightest is making sure your company is an attractive place to work. Therefore, recruitment and marketing need to play off one, each- one another. The job of the recruiter isn't just to find p- great potential hires. It's to get those hires to apply and commit. And then they give this simple example, career advancement tips. If you're hoping to attract talent that's looking for a job, Think about what they're interested in reading about. Job seekers probably want to learn more about, you know, how to advance their careers in your industry. So sharing tips about how people can get ahead and move up the ladder will always be appreciated. I think I think it's an interesting approach. No shit, it's not people. an interesting approach. It's just content marketing. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's just providing content at the uh, like the pre-interest phase of the the, the buyer's journey, which is the the sales per- I guess the would be the hiring manager as opposed to a salesperson. Um, so maybe they got this the wrong way around. Maybe you want to uh, court the hiring managers because they're the ones with the budgets as opposed to the people that you get in, you're placing. Um, but yeah, this is content marketing. And I'm sure tons of recruiters are doing this already. But this will definitely separate corporate recruiters versus people who are doing like freelance headhunting and stuff like that, where it's just Jill just rings you up and offers you a, a potential for career advancement versus Barry from recruiters.com calls you, which is... I have no idea if that's a real website, but you then you've seen so much of their content that automatically you have an affinity with Barry. I agree, hundred percent. I, I love the approach. I think for those who are not doing it, now's the time to start doing it if you want, because I think the job market is getting tighter, at least here in the U.S. Uh, last count, we have ten point nine million open jobs that we haven't filled in the U.S. Why have they not filled, Victor? Well, uh, there are several theories here. Uh, one is that, you know, people are still living off their um, pandemic checks, which is why, you know, some of the, uh, I'll say the, uh, I don't want to say lower skilled jobs. Yeah, lower skilled jobs, probably more appropriate. Uh, so that's one reason. Uh, maybe a lot of these people are entering the market, but want to come in at a higher rate or a higher pay, especially after all the attrition that happened. A lot of people got probably laid off. So I'm sure it's a mixed bag of things, but, you know, it's pretty high. 10.9 million open jobs is pretty high as of last month. So what you're saying is you need to open the Mexican border, right? Oh, no, we're joking. Done. We won't go there. We won't go there. No, they, they've already I'm done teasing that. you. By the way, they've already done that. We just haven't done it formally. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Okay, well, everything that we talked about so far, you can find in the show notes of this episode over at thisweekinsales.com, which we've both neglected to plug the whole episode. Uh, for Culture Corner, I've got one uh, thing that I wanted to just drop in here. So it's not launched yet. By this time next week, it probably will have launched, depending on uh, how many hours I put in this weekend. I'm going to a wedding on Saturday, one of my best mates from, from uni. So I mean, <laughs> it may be slightly delayed. It's about how, long, how hunger over I am on Sunday and Monday. But that, by the way, by the way, that was just like too much information on your personal life right there. Just too much information. The, the people want to know. People want to know this know. stuff, Victor. They don't want to know you go to your 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 friend's wedding who you Hold know at uni, and, and you might be too drunk to actually actually buy a commitment. We on a, talk about on a Sunday, we talk about follow through here. We're talking about follow through here, Will, and you're saying I might be drunk and not might be able to launch it. I mean, what kind of example is that? Set, it might it might be delayed because I usually don't take any time <laughs> off during the week. And don't forget, Victor, <laughs> last week you're saying that this is about we spent a good twenty minutes talking about you, Pebbles the sausage dog, and a basket and a helmet. True. This- we, we, in Culture Corner, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel here, aren't we? Just a little bit. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Will. I mean, my apologies. My apologies. Will. So Go ahead. it should Go hopefully on. launch next week, <laughs> unless the unless the uh, the wedding is a proper kind of blowout pie. So we'll, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But hey, by the way, you guys do bachelor parties in the UK? Yeah, I went to a bachelor party um, last weekend. We went surfing. We went on. I know this sounds ridiculous, but an adult soft play. Uh, to the point of it, it was that mental that I had whiplash. I, I hurt my neck wait up. from jumping off stuff. Ad- wait a minute. You're going, what do you mean an adult soft play? What is that? I don't. So you'll know what I mean if I can find the correct words to dumb it down for the American audience here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, soft play. A good portion of our audience is now. That's all right. We, we've kept the 6% of the <laughs> Indian market on, on board here. Uh <laughs> Soft plays like um, uh, like ball pools and rope swings and all this kind of stuff in an indoor environment. It would usually be for seven year olds. Does that make sense? So you call that you? That's what you do at a bachelor party. Well, it's one of the uh, activities before then going out and getting pissed later on. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Go on, dude. Go have, on. You, have you ever been surfing? 
No, I've never been surfing. So this is a artificial, uh, like a big kind of, if you imagine like a, a zero stretched out with a big wave machine that goes up and down the middle and then creates, of course, uh, small waves for beginner surfers and it can be ramped up and down and it's predictable unlike the sea. It was a great laugh. I had a great time. I stood up in an hour. I stood up on the surfboard twice and I was absolutely shattered on, on the back of it from getting <laughs> kind of thrown around and thrown off and run over by other people at the bachelor party. Um, that sounds fun. It that sounds laugh. fun. Uh, that sounds really fun. I've seen, by the way, I've seen videos of it mm -hmm. and it, it looks easier than it really is. Am I right? It's oh, like yeah, for sure. Because oh, don't yeah. forget, the beginner wave that I was on, it feels like you're going fast when it hits you and then you're trying to balance yourself and you jump up and you're only actually riding the wave when I stood up on it for maybe like 40 foot, something like that. Not, not very far at all. But then you look at it from a spectator and the wave might be two foot high. Like it's tiny. Like it's, there's funny. barely <laughs> any wave. So then when you see the pros on the same, um, the same system, the same artificial wave machine, and the wave is, say, eight, nine foot, and the carving it going back and forth, and you can barely stand up on it. It just shows. It goes to show how uh, kind of how, how skillful it is. I'm sure if I got stuck into it, I, I'd be okay. I, I tend to be quite good. Uh, I tend to be not quite good. I tend to be okay at like mountain biking, skateboarding, surfing, those kind of things. Um, I, I think I've got relative good balance in that, but it's definitely a skill. I'm trying to do that in yeah. the sea when everything's too unpredictable, and mm. uh, there's probably more nervousness of what's going on and people around you and stuff. It must be even harder to learn that environment. It's got to be hard. All right, I interrupted you. You were going to make an announcement. Let's get back to the announcement. This well, is important. You, I feel like you just sucked all the wind out of it now, Vic. Just like, it's a big announcement, just like, just, just deflated. Just... No, I did, no, I did. It's, we've just, it's a buildup. It's like, people are saying, people are saying, get to it, get to it. I mean, yeah, the people anticipation. Are saying, hurry up so I can to... listen to the next episode of a different podcast. That's why they're hurrying okay. up us. I don't want to miss okay. anything, but <laughs> right. Uh, long story short, Salesman.org, we hopefully next week will have launched. There's, uh, all joking aside, there's a few technical things that we need to get through and get ticked off and uh, get the developers working on. So that's really what's delaying things as opposed to me uh, being hungover on Sunday. So hopefully by this time next week, on next week's show, episode 41, uh, we'll be able to uh, kind of touch on it and I'll outline it in, in more detail if, if required. But Salesman.org, opening the doors. Previously, you had to come on the podcast to be interviewed or be a co-host with uh, Victor Antonio or Daniel Disney or the few of the other experiments that we've done over the years to get on the platform. We're now opening up to contributor posts, guest posts. There's a rigorous uh, series of guidelines that you've got to uh, reach. And people have been angry, Victor, at the fact that I've not allowed a few posts to come on. I've, you know one of the people that has sent an angry email that is post quality which is not good enough to get on the platform but share with me afterwards share with me afterwards <laughs> I, I may not share it with you because you do know him very well okay um so it'll come out in time i'm sure you'll tease it out with me but if you work in b2b sales if you've got something you think is gonna be valuable for other b2b sales people if you want to have on a you know in our space a relatively well-known platform sales.org if you want to have content on there which you can link to on your profile uh, on linkedin you can share on the platform it's it's social proof if your article is good enough quality to get on there um, and you might even generate a bit of attention from your your peers and your colleagues then you can drop me an email will at salesman.org and i'll send over the contributor uh, guidelines or if you go to the bottom of salesman.org in the footer, the contributor guidelines are there as well. And I'd love to uh, have a chat with you and see if you can, uh, or if you want to work with us, we'll edit the content, we'll guide you <clears> through <throat> the content, especially if you're a B2B salesperson rather than a professional writer. Uh, the team will spend a ton of time with you to make it happen, make it work. But yeah, we're opening the doors to external parties, Victor. And um, it's really exciting for us. We want to become like a, a the database, the searchable database for all sales training content to help what uh, accomplish our mission which is to make selling simple congratulations well and again to repeat if your content gets accepted it'll be on the email newsletter right well that goes sure. out to how many people so the our email list now it says 110 it says 100,000 people on the uh, on the on the doc here and thank you for plugging it because i totally missed my own writing uh, it's actually about 110,000 people and um, so yeah it'll go out think to about think about that if you get accepted it goes out to over 100,000 people. I mean, that's a big carrot right there. That's a big motivator for somebody to actually submit some great content. Uh, look, even further, if you can get us a post, we'll work with you, we'll help you edit it, we'll get it rocking and rolling out to the email list, and then we perhaps can feature you on the Salesman podcast as well. A formal interview, again, 
you'll get videos on the back of it, you'll get tons of content on the back of it that you can reshare to your audience, and it's just that social proof that will set you apart. Um, and there we go. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sell anyone. If you're not interested, it's fine. We've got tons of people uh, kind it's of replying every day. You're not, by the way, you're not selling. I think it's a great idea. So drop Will an email at will at salesman.org to be considered. I'm sure he'll send you the uh, requirements. And, you know, it's a layup, Matt. After that, by the way, once you're done doing that, I want to talk about my bike. I want to, can I talk about my bike since we talked about it last week? I want to talk about my, my new Rad Runner 1 electric bike. I wouldn't so know I, if you fell off it yet. No, I, see, the thing you're so negative, Will. You're just negative. By the way, look at the fat tires. We got pictures of it. We'll post it on the uh, on the page. So it took me about an hour to probably put it all together. It rides like a champ. I mean, it really rides good, or well rather. And then also, uh, I clocked myself. There's a, like a speedometer, one of those. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we call that you know speedometers. You can just pass by to tell you what speed. Uh, highest rate I could get was 18 miles per hour, which is pretty quick, actually. Get in, but, uh, there'll be an app on your phone that'll tell you how fast you're going using GPS. Yeah, I could use that as well. Yeah. So I haven't got that. There's a little, there's so many things. You, look, what, what's clever about Rad Water, the Rad company here is that all these attachments cost you a little bit more. The amount of upselling that they don't even upsell you. They just present it. You wind up buying more. Like I bought a rack for the front. Plus the basket. Now I bought another rack for the back, or uh, rather a basket for the back with a doggy holder because I, I don't think the front one's going to be big. So that thing's going to be loaded up. You can buy like an attachment to actually hold your phone. I mean, there's so much stuff you can buy for this thing that it, it's it's a perfect example of the upsell part, the long tail of actually selling, you know, uh, accessories. So it's a great bike, Rad Runner One. I highly recommend it. Rides like a champ. That's it. I'm slightly confused as I thought you were a bit of an action taker, go getter, you know, world class motivational speaker. If the bike does 30 or mile an hour, why have you only done 18? No, I think that's the top speed is 18. That I think because I opened her up. That, I think that's the top <laughs> speed. So I, I've gone the top speed. And by the way, you for find me, a big hill. Like, by the way, no, no. Look, I'm not. I'm not that. Look, I fell off a bike. I think I told you in Jamaica I broke my arm, so I don't want to do this again. I just remembered. So, how's your head? Oh, dude, the scar's almost gone. See that? I can't like, see it now. Yeah, it's like right there. So it's, like, it's almost gone. So, uh, I, you know, I'm too old to be taking risks. Just too old. You know, I got, I got, I got to keep my game. You know, safe. Now, my my wife makes me wear the helmet, and and don't laugh at this, but I even got a uh, one of those construction looking vests, fluorescent light That's green. Fair if you, Just if to make sure nobody hits me. If you're driving on the roads, that's more than sensible. I've re so I uh, used to do a little bit of uh, mountain biking, downhill mountain biking, and mm. I would uh, throw the bike in the car, drive places, of course. But I've only really driven on the road once, and it was such a stupid experience. For anyone who is in the UK, lives near me, uh, everyone will know Headingley in Leeds. It's where all the students are at. It's a mad bit of town, and uh, I drove up there once, and it was just insane. Car's not giving you any space. People beeping at you. I clearly didn't know what I was doing. With uh, you know, I, I know the appropriate hand signals and stuff trying to cross the road and that. Uh, but I cl it clearly wasn't experienced on the bike, and people in cars were right assholes. So I don't envy anyone who's driving on the road. At least you got get a little bit of speed up and get away from cars at lights or whatever. Versus me trying pedal away on a on a big heavy downhill bike. Yeah, we live in the suburb here, and they're making the uh, they're making bike paths and they're making the streets more bike friendly. Mm -hmm. And so even the the sidewalks are being wide. So if you got a seven foot wide sidewalk, you can actually go on the sidewalk. It's multi path. So they're they're very conscious of encouraging people to either get a bike, right? Or what I'm starting to see now is some, some really some crazy pimped out golf carts, just macked out. I mean, just poof, decked. You know, I mean, it, it, there's some pretty amazing things around here. So and we live in the suburbs, so you know. It's, we got some traffic, but not a lot of traffic. Sure. I, I used to live, uh, have you ever been to Cambridge in the UK? I've not. So I used to live just outside Cambridge, would go in, mm. into Cambridge for, for drinks. And it's full of just rich students, right? It's totally uh, not Snobs. my- not, kind, kind of. Like, it, shouldn't, it, shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be bigoted and paint people of Cambridge with a broad brush, but a little bit, right? Um, but the amount, of, and the amount of push, because I'm I'm a scally from Liverpool, right? So th there is that kind of uh, that gap there. But the amount of people on bikes, it's insane, Victor. The roads come secondary to the people driving bikes. Have you ever been to Amsterdam? It's very similar there as well. Mm, I've seen that. Yeah, I've been to Amsterdam. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. It's absolutely mad. 
Like you, yeah. the the pedestrian comes third, then cars, then push bikes, and you're wow. going to get mowed down if you're not listening for for bells and people screaming uh, foreign languages down you down the side of your head. So with that, Victor. By the way, that's the other thing. Before I leave, uh, that's the other thing. I need to get a rear view mirror for my helmet. Just thought I'd throw that in. Sorry. How does that work? Would you the rear view mirror? Would it not just be yeah. on your handlebar? Oh, no, it's a little. You know, it's not as cool. I think, but you know, okay. But to have a rear view mirror on your helmet, you got to have a big thing sticking out the side, right? That, well, yeah, it's not that big. It's not like your endoscope. You're gonna be. You know, you're gonna be driving you're, around. Your endoscope. It's just a little. You're thing gonna be like driving around, just take it out. Uh, Passes oh. by when you when you look. Someone's gonna go, hey, hey Victor, it's Victor Antonio. Oh, you, you could like KO the next person that comes along. All right, wrapping up. <laughs> okay, that was this week in sales. Bit of a weird ending here. That's fine. It's episode forty-one. At fifty, we're gonna have a celebration. I'm gonna send you a cake. Uh, so we're nine episodes away from that. Victor Antonio, sales legend. Are you? Have you broken two hundred thousand YouTube subscribers yet? Uh, I'm almost like one ninety-nine now. So maybe next couple of weeks or so. Uh, it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Holding on, holding on. It'll be another month or so. But yeah, we'll get to 200. We got to have a celebration of 200,000. Sure. We'll, we'll sure. do something nice for that. Uh, so maybe another cake. We'll just have cakes every week. It'll be that great. Um, so that was Victor Antonio, sales legend, the, the biggest YouTube channel for just sales and, and motivation. We'll link that in the show notes. Now I've mentioned it over at thisweekinsales.com. My name is Will Barron, founder of salesman.org. And we'll speak with you again on next week's This Week in Sales. <laughs>